Hey guys, my name is David. Welcome to Fearless TV. We're so excited you've joined us today. I know this message is going to impact you in such a powerful way. If you've been watching our previous messages or even today, you're just positively impacted or really moved by this message, we encourage you to share it with a friend. Put it on your Facebook, your Instagram story. We want to get the word out about what God is doing through Fearless here in LA. Or if you're saying, hey, how do I further partner with the mission of what Fearless is doing, what God is really doing through our church, in downtown LA, reaching these, these people who don't know Jesus, we have our Fearless Partnerships. It's basically just a group of people who are giving monthly, whether a part of our church or your state's away, and you're just saying, I want to sow into what God is doing. You can give monthly to the vision of Fearless. You can go to fearlessla.com, click on the giving link. There's a whole description in there. I encourage you read about it, pray on it, and just be obedient to the voice of God as He speaks to you. Other than that, check out this amazing message from our pastor. We love you guys. We'll see you soon. as you know is to be fearless and that is that is look through the eyes of loving more and fearing less it's real simple to be fearless every day we just take a step towards love and a step away from fear come on we're, we're done walking towards fear we're ready to walk towards love this is going to be our mission for the rest of our life we're going to walk towards love and walk away from fear until we get so wrapped up in love we're in heaven and fear is no more amen we might as well practice living in love if we're going to be there for all of eternity. Amen? So I'm so tired of fear. I'm so tired of shame. I'm so tired of guilt, controlling my life, anxiety, depression. Who's with me? Come on. I'm ready to be fearless. I'm ready to make fearless my mission. But if I'm going to make fearless my mission, I'm going to have to have some values. And my values are going to determine my decisions. They're going to determine my passions. They're going to determine who, who, is a, who gets to speak into my life and who doesn't. They're going to determine what open doors I walk through and which ones I don't. How many of you guys know there are some open doors that you shouldn't walk through? Not every open door is your door. Amen? Amen? Some of you who dated the wrong person understand that. Just because she said yes, just because he said yes didn't mean it was going to work out, <laughs> right? Not every open door is mine. And so we're going to learn our values. So once we get our values, we can center ourselves. We can have weight in our soul and we can do what we were born to do, be born for greatness. And we can embrace our mission to love more, to fear less, to be a fearless church. Because how many of you guys know a scared world needs a fearless church? Come on, do you know anybody that needs a fearless church? Come on, maybe you need that fearless church. You've been to a lot of churches and you say, man, I've been to a lot of churches that are full of fear and I'm ready for a fearless church, a church that loves more and fears less. Amen? Amen. So we've been going through those values and our first value that we've been tackling is that worship is our weapon. Worship is a weapon in the house of God. Worship is a weapon for the people of God. It's not an obligation. It's not something we do at the beginning of service. In fact, it's not something you do at all. It's something you possess. Worship does not leave you and really should never leave your side. A lot like the weapons of those who are trained in the art of military or war they never let their weapon out of their sight. In fact, uh, many, many uh, people have told me that when you enter the Marines or different uh, ranks of the Army, th there is a rule in the Marines 
that you cannot be without eyesight of your weapon. Even when you're taking a shower or sleeping, your weapon has to be next to you. You name your weapon. You, you know how to take it apart and put it back together. You constantly clean your weapon. You, 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 it becomes a part of you. It's an extension of who you are. And so if worship is our weapon, it's not something we do. It's not even just something we possess. It is an extension of who I am. Worship is my weapon. And so we started diving deeper into this, this thing of worship. And uh, we found out that worship is not just my weapon, that, that worship also, number two, protects the throne. That, that, that David said that God is enthroned in our praises. That worship sets up a throne that honors God in the middle of my circumstance. So no matter what you're walking through today, if fear is on the throne, if anxiety is on the throne, if depression is on the throne, if meeting the demands of today is on the throne, if stress is on the throne, if you will worship in that place, it will enthrone God and dethrone that thing. Amen. Number three, worship brings freedom. We know that wherever worship is, the spirit of the Lord is. And we know where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Second Corinthians 317. Number four, worship is a sacrifice. It must cost me. If it doesn't cost, it's not worship. It has to cost me. I cannot worship for you. Your neighbor's worship cannot be your worship. Worship has to come through you because if it doesn't cost you, it's not worship in your behalf. Worship must cost. So when it's awkward, when I don't feel like it, best time to worship. When, it, when I don't like the song, but I lift the praise anyways, even greater than not liking the song, when I feel like God isn't who he promised he would be when I feel like he forgot me. What a great opportunity to worship because then it is a sacrifice of praise. Amen. We are the thing on the altar. We're living sacrifices before our God. So it's not just a, a, a praise out of my mouth. It's a praise with my life. I am, I am the sacrifice of praise. My life is a sacrifice. This means my time, my talent, my resource, my finances. This is all worship. When we do tithes and offerings and you can worship with the best of them. And as soon as David comes up and starts reading the scripture, your, your, your hands go down and your butt gets tight. And your wallet is closed. And you go, God, I wish they would stop talking about money and start singing oceans. You missed it because worship is a sacrifice of my resources too, not just my voice, not just my time. It's putting our first before God, before we get ours. It's not giving God our leftovers, but giving him our first. Amen. Amen. Come on. We got some worshipers in this house. Worship is fruit. Number five, worship is fruit. It, it, it doesn't, it's not a seed. So if you, if you think you're going to get into a situation and all of a sudden you're just going to have the fruit of worship, you do not have fruit unless you first have a seed, you have manure, you have time. So, so true worship comes from the seed of the word being planted in the soil of my heart, surrounded by the manure of my life. And pretty soon, through the process of time, there is worship developed in me that at the proper season comes out of me. Worship does not begin at 930 when service starts. The worship you gave today, if it was true worship, started maybe six months ago when that that seed was planted in your heart. Okay. When you see someone worship in the storm, it wasn't because they were that good. It wasn't because they worked it up that well. It's because his word is that good. And when his word gets planted below the surface, you can't see it, but it's in there. Please believe me. In about six months, this word right here is going to produce a worship in you when you need it. Come on. We want fruit that remains. 
So if we want fruit that remains, we got to get seed that remains. we got to constantly be pouring more word in our heart, even when we feel like we don't need it. I'm not listening to the word for now. I'm getting it inside me for six months from now. When I'm going to feel like quitting, giving up, walking away, it's going to be a fruit of worship on my lips. Come on, do we have any worshipers in the house? Are you ready for today's? Number six, worship is my promotion. Come on, touch your neighbor and say, you've just been promoted. How good does it feel to get a promotion? How good does it feel if your boss comes over and says, you've done such an incredible job. You've been so faithful that today you're not getting fired. You're getting moved down. You're getting moved up. And to the level I'm moving you up, you can never be moved back down. See, once you get a promotion, <clears throat> it's it. This is your new normal. <clears throat> I'm believing for a new normal in your life. I'm believing that this promotion, worship is my promotion. I, I know you're waiting for <clears throat> people's words to promote you. I know you're waiting for that job to say you're valuable to God or, or that blessing you've been waiting for. But worship is the blessing. Worship is your promotion. I'll explain it more, but just, just get excited because you're being promoted today. You, uh, and it's not you who's done a good job. It's someone else who did a good job for us. It's not me who paid the price. It was him who paid the price so that I could be promoted to the position of worship. Now, I I am a, um, I I am a both, um, how do I say this? I, I, uh, um, I, I am both a get to the point and a beat around the bush person. It just depends on which area we're in. I'm a little schizophrenic in this. And my wife is also both a beat around the bush and a get to the point person. Usually in life, you're either one or the other. Uh, You're either, what's the point? I'm in this conversation. I don't really know what's happening, but I'm just trying to get to the point. You know, any, any, I need to get to the point kind of people out there. Okay, let me see. Um, Any beat around the bush kind of people. There, there may not be a point. Who knows what will happen? And, and, and if you're a, if you're a get to the point kind of person, you probably will marry a beat around the bush kind of person. Uh, because if two get to the point people get married, they may kill each other. But if two beat around the bush people try to get married, they'll never get married because they're always beating around the bush and they'll never get to it. And so you kind of need both in a relationship. So me and my wife, for some reason, we've been built this way where one of us will be beat around the bush and one of us will be beat, uh, get to the point. If we ever have a fight, it's because we both became one or the other. And so for me, I always wonder, what is God? Is God a beat around the bush or is he get to the point? And so I started thinking for a get to the point person, it's all about the bottom line. And so I started thinking for God in my life, you know, here's the whole Bible. A lot of it feels a little bit beat around the bush. And we're just talking about this. We're dealing with this. We're doing this. We're, we're, we're talking. About, and so, so the values that we're giving you are the get to the point values. We're not going to beat around the bush. We're just going to. This is the whole word. We're excited about the whole word, but we're going to get to the point. So I started thinking about everything God is for my life. What is God's get to the point or bottom line for my life? And I can see through the beat around the bush of the word that his bottom line for my life is relationship. It is connection. This is why we say we're not going to be religious here because God's bottom line is not religion. This is why we say we're not going to first worry about the rules because God's bottom line is not the rules. You know that, right? God's bottom line isn't even the Ten Commandments. Oh, you can't say that. God's bottom line is relationship. The only reason why we have the commandments is, is a covenant of relationship. It's, it's not a contract because a contract tells you how we're going to how we're going to sue each other when we split apart a covenant tells you how we're going to stay together the 10 commandments are not a contract they're a covenant they're not defining the terms what happens when we split up they're defining the terms this is how we stay together 
the Bible and the word is God is not giving you rules so that so that you will be punished or weighted down. He's saying, look, this he says, says things like this. He says, look, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. Well, you might say, well, God, that's so mean. What if I want to come to you through Buddha? What if I want to come to you through yoga? What if I want to come to you through Confucius? Well, well, how come you could be so set in your ways? And I just don't think a God that is loving would be like that. Well, let me tell you this. Uh, I live in the Arts District. The best way to get to the Arts District is to go up the 101 to get off at the 5. And then once you go on the 5, to go off on 4th Street. If you get off on 4th Street, go right because if you go too long, you'll miss the first turn. And then after the first turn, go left, and you'll find my house right there. When you get there, there's a call box. Dial 214. Now, someone could come to me and go, wow, that's so mean. I mean, what if I want to take the 405? I said, well, you can take the 405, but you won't get to my house. <laughs> so the rule is not to punish you. It's to guide you to relationship. So what is God's bottom line? It's not the rules. It's not even the book. It's the connection with who wrote the book. This is why it's not God the Father and the Holy Scriptures. This is his love letter. Look, we need, to, we need to say, God, this love letter is only important because there's an author. Don't read his Bible without the author. Make sure you get the author into your environment because God's bottom line with you. We don't need to beat around the bush today is relationship. He seeks and longs to have real connection with you. Not not fake connection, not false connection, not even preacher connection. A God in a microphone talking to you. He longs to have communication where he talks and you respond. Where he speaks and you listen and you speak back. And he listens. And worship is your promotion. You see, the first worship leader in heaven was someone you probably would have never expected. Who lost his job and the position was empty. There are three archangels mentioned in the Bible. And these archangels were leaders of the angelic armies. Does anybody know their names? Shout it out if you know. Gabriel, that's one. Michael, that's another. Who's the third? Lucifer. There were three archangels in the Bible. Gabriel. Michael and Lucifer. Wow, that's weird. And in Gabriel, his job was the word. Every time we see Gabriel, his job is to bring the word to the earth, is is to carry the word. In fact, it was Gabriel who gave the word to Mary. It was Gabriel when, when, when the word was getting ready to get delivered. God didn't call upon Michael He sure as heaven didn't call upon Lucifer. He called upon Gabriel. And Gabriel appeared to Mary with with his job to carry the word. It was Michael's job to deliver prayer. And in act of prayer, it was Michael who showed up to Daniel when he was praying. And, and, And there was a spiritual battle in the heavenly realms. The Bible says that it was Michael who was fighting through spiritual forces to get to Daniel to answer his prayer. It's Michael who carries your prayers. But Lucifer, well, he was in charge of worship. Lucifer was the worship leader in heaven. It was Gabriel who ruled the word, Michael who ruled the prayer, and Lucifer who ruled the worship. But he lost his job. God wondered, who can I get? I don't need someone to replace carrying the word. I don't need someone to replace carrying prayer. I need someone to fulfill this position of worship. And so heaven 
put out a resume description online in the corridors of heaven and they searched the earth to and fro. No angel would do. No one was ready. And God said, what will I do? So God reached into the dirt. Mm. Isaiah 14, 11 tells us this story about Lucifer, who we would now call the devil. It says, how far have you fallen, O morning star, son of the dawn? You have been cast down to the earth, you who laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mountain of assembly and on the utmost heights of Mount Zephon. I will ascend above. Do you see that a lot? Above, raise, high, above the clouds. I will make myself like the most high God. But you were brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. All your pomp has been brought down to the grave along with the noise of your harps. Maggots are spread out beneath you and worms will cover you. If if we were to say God's bottom line is relationship, now let's ask this. What is Lucifer's bottom line? According to this verse, We see over and over again, I will ascend, I will rise up, I will be bigger than God, I will be worshipped higher than God. If we were to say what was Lucifer's bottom line, we would say to ascend, to raise, to be seen, to be noticed, to be influential. That's weird, that sounds a lot like most of our bottom line. But it makes sense because we know that we have the Adamic nature inside of us. We know that desire to be seen, to be worshipped, to be praised, to be liked, to be like God runs in our veins. But really, was it Adam who sinned first or Satan? So really, could we call it an Adamic nature or maybe we would call it a Satanic nature? Now, this is a crazy message to preach to Hollywood, but here we go. Because in Hollywood, it's time to be seen. It's time to be noticed. I want you. Look, let let me ask you this. Let me make sure everyone is in the same boat because maybe it's just me. Uh, Let me just make sure you all have that same nature inside of you. Because maybe there's some angels here and some very uh, amazing people here. And I know there are amazing people that come to Fearless. Maybe I'm just the only one. Let me ask you this question. When you take a photo, group photo, who do you look at first? (laughs) someone's pointing up to heaven and that person's a liar because they don't look up at heaven first. The first person you look at to judge if this picture can be seen, can be used, can be put on Instagram is what? Do I look good? You may blame it on other things. Oh yeah, everyone just kind of looks crazy in this. No, no. You look crazy and that's why you don't want the picture out. You made that funk face or you got the third chin going on. I don't know what it is, but there's no filters going to clean it up, baby. And so you said, let's throw that thing away. Erase that off your phone. How do we know? Because that is our adamic or satanic nature that is living on board of the holy person called you. Now, this is a funny thing. I'm not, I'm not hating on anybody that doesn't like their picture and group pictures, but I'm just saying it reveals to us that in our world, we think about me, myself, and I. And the reason why we do, it's okay that you do, that is your adamic nature. It is the nature that says, I want to ascend. I want to be higher. I want to be noticed. I want to. So, so here's what God says. He says, come on, come and die with me. You know what he's doing? He's saying, come get rid of that edemic nature. Come get rid of that satanic nature. This is worship. This is what it looks like to get your new job, to get your new position. When you say, God, thank you for, look, thank you for taking me up. But God, thank you for the cross. Thank you for my hard days. Thank you for the things I've gone through. Thank you for the sacrifice of praise. I will worship you when I don't feel like it. I don't need to be seen. I want you to be seen. 
See, God says for those people, for your new job, I'm going to provide you a garment. Isaiah 61, 4, he says, uh, 61, uh, 3, he says, and provide for those who grieve in Zion and bestow on them a crown of victory, in, in, uh, of, of, a crown of beauty instead of ashes, oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display and, and his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore the devastated places they will renew the they will they will renew the uh, ruined cities they will have, they have been devastated for years this is your call god has given you a job promotion he has demoted the enemy in fact jesus said the demotion was quick he said i saw satan fall like lightning from heaven he said i want to go up and god said you're going down he said you're going down so far you will live amongst the dead Isn't it unique that God's work in our life rose us from death to life? Isn't it unique that Satan went from life to death, but we went from death to life? We got a reverse order. We got his job, and his job was the worship leader in heaven. I came to talk to the worship leaders in heaven. I know you didn't know you had that job because some of us look like this when we came in. And we say, well, it's not my personality to have this job. It's not my culture to have that. My culture kind of just relaxes. My personality isn't all crazy. Oh, well, when you get a job, you change your personality. Right? My personality is really shy until I am the barista at a coffee shop. And there are five rules. i got to say hi to everyone that comes in. Hi, 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 hi. I've never seen you say hi so much. Well, I overrode my personality because my job was more powerful. I didn't want to lose my job because I have been given a promotion. Come on, you got a promotion today. I, I love what this says, Ephesians 2, 3. It says, all of us who lived, lived at one time amongst them, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, our Adamic, satanic nature, and followed the desires of our thoughts. Like the rest... We were by nature deserving wrath, but because of his great love for us. Come on, this is God's bottom line. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It was by grace that we have been saved, and God raised us up, up, up. Come on, Satan wanted to go up, but God said, you're going down. But he looked at who was down, and he said, you're about to go up. And he didn't raise us up to that level of archangel. It says that he raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that the coming ages he might show us incomparable riches of grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and not through yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works. Look, you didn't earn this promotion. Someone earned it for you. It is not by works so that no one can boast for we are God's handiwork. Look at this. Created in Christ to do the works, to do the good works which Christ prepared for us in advance to do. So y'all thought this was going to Watts. Y'all, y'all thought the good works were saying hi to someone. Y'all thought the good works were being kind. No, no what is your works if your position is worship leader? How do you work in your new position? You begin to worship in all situations. Come on, I'm not waiting until I get to heaven to lead the, the heavenly armies. I'm not waiting until I get to heaven to lead the heavenly choirs. I am leading them right now. They are waiting on my cue. Angels are waiting on my cue. Heavenly choirs are waiting on my worship. Why? Because I'm the worship leader of heaven. I may have to turn my back on the crowd to lead the choir in praise, but it is my job, and I've been given a promotion today, and I ain't letting it pass i was so low but he saw me i was so down and he saw me satan came to god and said god how are you ever going to replace me you you know that satan has instruments built into his body no wonder he uses music look at this i want to i want to read this because i I need to find it because i want to make sure you see it and uh and i'll end on this Ezekiel 28, 13. Thank you. Thank you. Got it. It gave it to me. 
Ezekiel 30, uh, 28, 13, it says, you were in Eden. You know there are only three things in Eden. There was God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Adam and Eve, there four, and Satan. You were in Eden, the garden. Every precious stone adorned to you, ruby, topaz, emerald, chrysolite, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, beryl, gold work of tambourines and pipes was in you. In the day that you were created, they were prepared for you. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I set you so that you were on a holy mountain. You have walked down in the midst of the stones of fire. Another verse tells us uh, that, that, that uh, I read it earlier, Isaiah 14, 11, it says, all the, pomp, all the prompt has been brought down to the grave along with the noise of your harps. So we see three things that were built into Satan besides rubies all over his bottle. The only, the only reason why he'd have rubies is to reflect. Rubies and diamonds, they reflect something else. They are a stone that they reflect. So he would get in the presence of God and his body would glimmer and glean and it would reflect God. It's unique, and I don't have time to show you this, but the priest, the, the priest that would come before God and worship, the outfit God designed for him had all these same stones in it. What was God saying? You got a new position. Inside of Satan's body were, 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 were tambourines, percussive instruments. If you get a tambourine, it's a percussive instrument. Inside of his body were, were, were flutes, wind instruments, and inside of his body were harps, stringed instruments. There are only three kind of instruments that will ever hit this stage. Percussion, stringed, and wind. Those are the three instruments that cover the whole world. How unique is it that God gave you those three things built into your body too? Your percussion. If you've never clapped before the Lord, you didn't realize you had, a, you had an instrument built into your body. Your percussion. Come on, some of you, are, you, don't, you don't even need an instrument to praise God. You can stomp. You can dance. You can clap. Come on, this is the power of my first instrument. Then you have strings. Your, your vocal cords are like strings. That's why my voice goes out sometimes because on one of my strings, I got a knot on it and it rubs against the other one. It's called nodules. And it, and it takes out my vo- On your vocal cords, they are the strings of your body. When you sing, God's playing on the strings. You're, you're playing the strings of your body. And to sing, you're giving God the breath back that he put in you. So you got the wind instrument, you got the stringed instrument, and you got the percussive instrument built into your body. And you have been given a new garment called praise. And he's exchanged from the spirit of despair to the garment of praise. And so if I was Satan, I would work overtime at my bottom line, bringing low who God made high so I could feel higher than the low I had been brought. Isn't that what the enemy works on overtime in your life? The moment you get in here to worship, the enemy goes, but you're not that holy. Why would you even give God praise with your mouth? Did you hear what your mouth was saying yesterday? You know what he's trying to do? He's trying to bring you back to the place of the dead so you cannot be the living soul that you're called to be. You have been set up with Christ Jesus. You've been given a new job. We are the worship leaders in heaven. Satan was running around to God when he's creating planets and solar systems and, and, and stars. And he's saying, God, who are you going to get? I mean, I was a pretty good worship leader. I got, I got diamonds and rubies and instruments. I mean, who is better than me at writing music? Who is better than me? Who are you going to find? No angel's going to do. No, none of these animals are going to do. Who are you, who are you going to find? Who are you going to even get to, to thank you for making these stars and, and praise you for making the sun? I mean, if you don't have me, you don't have anything. You shouldn't have left the position open. Do you, you want me back yet? I know you're wanting me back. God looked at Satan. Bent down to the dirt. And he said, I'll replace you with the dirt. God bent down to the dirt to show how great his power was. That he take he could take something all the way at the bottom. He wasn't looking for something perfect, he was looking for something broken. Because his power is revealed in the grace that he has in my life. See, worship is not about being perfect. Worship is about, I shouldn't be able to praise. I shouldn't be able to worship. I have no right having this job. But because of who chose me, he bends down. And what does God do? He spits in the dirt. He forms with his hands. 
He starts playing the dirt. He starts shaping the dirt. And he breathes his breath into the dirt. And Adam and Eve stand up. And the attack on Adam and Eve was against their identity. Did God really say, oh, if you eat this, you'll be like God? Their attack was that Adamic nature. Hey, you can, you, can, you can be better than God. You can be higher than God. You can be more noticed than God. And that's the exact attack that we go through every time God calls us to worship. Because the old employee is jealous of your new job position. Come on, I don't know about you, but that makes me want to praise even louder. That makes me want to worship even louder. I'm going to use cushion. I'm going to use my instruments. I'm going to open my voice. And I'm going to praise the one who gave me life. Come on, can we lift him up today? Can we worship him today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise you, God.